worship the God who was. We worship the God who is. We worship the God who evermore will be. He opened the prison doors. He parted the raging sea. My God, he holds a victory. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. thankful to the Lord that we serve a God worthy of praise. And as we come to his word this morning, uh, we're mindful of a very important subject that we are studying this year, and that is trust in him. We're learning that he is a trustworthy God, and we're going to see this morning again that we can trust the Lord in the area of our stewardship and I know this is an area where we all need reminding, sort of like yesterday when we were encouraging Christian marriages, and these are areas where you need to continually grow and be reminded. Next week, we'll begin a new series uh, uh, of trust messages and learn more about trusting the Lord in our family life. But today, uh, we want to again see the necessity of seeking first the kingdom of God in the area of stewardship. Now, over the last few years, uh, we've all seen new industries rise, and we've seen uh, uh, changes with respect to various uh, industries. In particular, I'm thinking now of the uh, hotel industry. 
uh, losing a lot of uh, its income stream to the Airbnb industry. How many of you have ever stayed in an Airbnb? Let me just see. Where are you? Wow. That is amazing. I have not had the experience yet, uh, but one of these days perhaps we will. And uh, a lot of folks uh, tell me that it's just the way to go. And the uh, Airbnb business has definitely exploded worldwide, uh, but recent days have given quite a number of complaints from the owners of these Airbnbs. And uh, there's been complaints from the owners of the Airbnb to the uh, Airbnb company and, of course, to the customers. Legal folks sometimes get involved. Uh, one owner wrote just uh, this past week regarding his property. He said after the, uh, after the Airbnb uh, renters had left, he walked into his property, and this is what he wrote about. He said, I returned to an overpowering smell of cannabis, as though dozens of people had been smoking. My house was filthy. The towels had been used to wipe muddy floors and smelled like booze. Wine glasses were broken or missing. Wine-stained floorboards. The vacuum cleaner was broken and smelled like cannabis, and there was some stuck to a chair cushion. A neighbor said a number of young people had been coming and going throughout the two days that the house had been rented. Now, these are the words of an unhappy owner. By the way, if you owned that property, how many of you would be unhappy, right? And uh, here's the problem they're talking about with the Airbnb is so many times their properties are just being trashed by these people coming in and, and renting them. And here's a, here's a very basic principle for us to realize when it comes to stewardship today. And that is that we need to realize this morning that owners have rights, but stewards have responsibilities. Owners have rights, but stewards have responsibilities. Now, I want you to think about this and say this phrase with me. Owners have rights, stewards have responsibilities. Ready, begin. Owners have rights, stewards have now, if an owner wants to go into his house and break a wall down with a sledgehammer, it's his house, right? He has the right to do that. Um, he may have a reason to do that. Owners have rights, but stewards have responsibilities. The fundamental question as we consider not only next week's offering, but all of life stewardship is who owns the things that are in your possession? Is God the owner? And if he is, then the question is, Lord, how do you want me to steward what you have given to me? Now, often Jesus spoke to his disciples about eternal things by speaking in parables about money. 16 of the 38 parables of Jesus deal with money and possessions because as we've learned, how we handle these things is a reflection of our heart oftentimes toward him. And in this parable that we read this morning in Matthew 25, Jesus is teaching about the coming kingdom of heaven and about the fact that we will give an account as that coming kingdom arrives with respect to the way we have lived our lives here on this earth. Uh, this particular chapter is a part of what is known as the Olivet Discourse. And as Jesus is teaching here in Matthew 24 and 25, he has come out of the temple and down uh, to the Mount of Olives, and he had been teaching them. He had said things, for example, about the temple. He said, uh, he said that uh, the temple, his body, the temple, if it was uh, to be destroyed, would be raised up in three days again. And he had been telling them that uh, he would be departing from them. And so it was here in Matthew 25 and verse 10, the Bible says, And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and they that were ready went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. Uh, speaking about uh, this opportunity then being lost, verse 14 says, For the kingdom of heaven is as a man traveling into a far country, who called his own servants and delivered unto them his goods. So Jesus is likening the kingdom uh, to a man that would go traveling and to a man that has delivered goods to his servants and that one day that man, the owner, would come back and he would ask these servants how they handled the resources that he had given to them. We know now that Jesus Christ is the master and the owner and that Jesus 
had told his disciples, I'm going away for a season, but I will come back and I will require of you an accountability of your stewardship. Now, as we begin this morning, I want to give you three introductory principles for stewards to remember. Three principles that stewards should remember. First of all, we must remember that God is the owner of all things. All blessings come from him. How many of you remember singing that when you were a child? Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Remember that? And uh, uh, Brother Hopkins, we need to sing that sometime again. The, uh, the, you're not really a Baptist if you don't sing it once in a while, right? Praise God from whom all blessings flow. How many of you believe this morning that all blessings in your life flow from God? So really, that's one of the reasons we're here. God has provided for us. Psalm 24, verse 1, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. God is the owner of all things. And secondly, we are the stewards of his blessings. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 4 and verse 2, moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. Now, that particular passage, 1 Corinthians 4, speaks about our stewardship of the Word of God, which is also a gift. But God says it is required of a steward that a man be found faithful. So every one of us are managers of a trust. God has entrusted us with some blessings, with some provisions, with some finances, and we are to be the managers of that trust. The essence of life, then, for us is not ownership, but stewardship. God is the owner. We are the stewards. Randy Alcorn once said, if God is the owner, I was the manager. I needed to adopt a steward's mentality toward the assets he had entrusted, not given to me. A steward manages assets for the owner's benefit. The steward carries no sense of entitlement to the assets he manages. It's his job to find out what the owner wants done with his assets, then carry out his will. Did you hear that last sentence? It's his job to find out what the owner wants done with his assets, then carry out his will. That's the primary question this week. Lord, as I approach this special offering, what do you want me to do with your assets? How do you want me to allocate them? Because these are not my accounts, these are not my assets, these are yours. It's like the father that took his son out to McDonald's and uh, they ordered their hamburgers and their fries and the dad really liked fries. How many of you are like me? You like French fries? How many of you love French fries? How many of you like McDonald's French fries? How many of you prefer In-N-Out French fries? All right, 50-50, right down the middle there. Uh, how many of you would take either one on a, you know, on a warm day or a cold day, any day? You'll have either one. They were sitting there enjoying their fries. Dad ate his fries completely gone first. So he very nimbly began just to take some of his son's fries from him, put them in the ketchup, eat the French fry. And uh, finally his son said, Dad, those are my fries. And his dad said, Son, now listen. He said, I want you to get this straight. I paid for those fries. I bought those fries. I'm the owner of those fries. The son didn't buy that real well. But let me encourage you with this fact. God is the owner of all things. Thirdly, we will give an account for our stewardship. God is the owner. We are the stewards. We will give an account for our stewardship. Now notice in Romans 14, by way of introduction, verse 10. But why dost thou judge thy brother, or why dost thou set it not thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. For it is written, As I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. Read this last verse with me, please. So then, every one of us shall give an account of himself to God. Let's say that together. So then... Now, in a few days, we'll have a group come here to Lancaster Baptist Church from Cape and Krause Auditors. They are certified public accountants. That's what they do. And we will lay out the books of the church as we do every year. 
and they will review all kinds of purchase orders. They will review all the, all the various checking accounts. They will look at all the internal functioning of the church, and they'll do that for a week or two. We'll pay them a large sum of money to do that. They are certified public accountants, and we prepare for that, and uh, we give them all the documentation that they need. God says one day there will be an accounting of your life and mine, and one day we will all stand before the Lord Jesus for how we have managed his things here on this earth, for how we have taken care of his business here on this earth. And so as we think about this principle of stewardship, let's look at the parable of Matthew 25, and let's try to glean what Jesus was telling his disciples in the first century. I want you to notice in your notes, first of all, there is a distribution of assets. Jesus speaks about a distribution of assets. And we see that distribution of assets here in chapter 25. And I want you to notice it specifically in verse number 14. The Bible tells us here in chapter 25 and verse number 14, the kingdom of heaven is as a man traveling into a far country who called his own servants and delivered unto them his goods. And unto one he gave five talents, unto another two, to another one, to every man according to his several ability, and straightway took his journey. Now, the man in Jesus' parable had three trusted servants to whom he entrusted certain possessions while he was away. To one, of course, five talents, to another two, to another he gives one talent. Satisfied that his money is now in capable hands, uh, he goes along the way on his journey. By the way, how many of you are grateful that God has deemed you worthy of whatever it is he's given to you? And oftentimes he does not give more until there's faithfulness in what has been given. He knows the ability. He watches how we steward. And so he has blessed according to his wisdom. And we see, first of all here, the provider of the resources. And this is God himself the provider of the resources. First Chronicles 29 and verse 10 speaks of this. Wherefore, God, uh, wherefore David blessed the Lord before all the congregation, and David said, Blessed be thou, Lord God of Israel, our Father, forever and ever. Thine, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty. For all that is in heaven and all that is, is in earth is thine. Thine is the kingdom, O Lord, and thou art exalted as head above all. Now watch this, verse 12. Both riches and honor come of thee. Thou reignest over all, and thine hand is power and might, and in thine hand is to make great and to give strength unto all. So riches and honor come from the Lord. He is the one that raises one up and puts one down another. He is the one that blesses. And so we see that the provider of the resources in our life is God. George Mueller, the great missionary and evangelist in England, once said, let us walk as stewards and not as owners, keeping ourselves the means with which the Lord has entrusted us. He has not blessed us that we may gratify our own carnal mind for the sake of using our money in his service and to his praise. God says, I want to bless you so that you can be a blessing to others. And this is what George Mueller said. We're to use what God gives to us for his purpose and for his praise. Now, the provider is God, and he provides according to his wisdom. James 1.17 says, Every good gift and every perfect gift cometh down from above, from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. Here we see in the word of God that he gives to these servants uh, talents, five talents, two talents, and one talent. Uh, talents were weighed gold or silver. A talent was about 93 pounds of gold. How many of you have ever had a boss that trusted you with 93 pounds of gold? Anybody here? I don't think so. So here we see a great example of trust. He is giving to them a great amount of gold or silver, and the talents came from the Lord. 1 Timothy 6.17 says, Charge them that are rich in this world that they be not high-minded, nor trust in riches, but in the living God, who giveth us all things to enjoy. 
Everything that you've received is from God, and you are to steward that. God says, I want you to use it. I want you to enjoy it, but I want you to hold it with a loose hand. Proverbs 22, 4, by humility and the fear of the Lord are riches and honor and life. And so this provision was from God. It was according to his wisdom that it was meted out. And it was according to the ability of the steward that it was given. Did you notice that? It said, according to his, in verse number 15, several ability, which means according to his strength, according to his wisdom, according to his knowledge, I'm going to give this to him so that he will be a wise steward with what I give to him. So the provider of the resource is whom class? Help me out. Who's the provider? God. He's the one that put the food on our table even this morning. Secondly, the people of his provision. The people of his provision. Now this is very simple, but I want you to notice it with me. And I want you to see the Bible says that he called his own. The Bible is very clear that uh, in this passage, in verse number 14, he called his own servants. The stewards were personally his servants. God is not asking the unsaved world to build the kids' city building. God is not asking pagans to build the kids' city building. He's not asking pagans to pay for gospel tracts. He's not asking pagans to support his missionary endeavor. He's calling upon his own servants to participate in this project. And so Jesus mentions here uh, three levels of responsibility, five, two, and one. And they represent uh, their ability and their wisdom in this area. And God is telling them, I'm going to provide the raw material, but I want you to go out and do something with this. I'm going to give you a certain amount, but I want you to make it grow. I want you to steward it well. And God has done that with us. He's provided us with children. He's provided us with belongings. He's provided us with talents. And he's provided us with time. And he says, I want you to take what I've given to you, and I want you to see it multiplied. I want you to use it for my glory. And so we see the distribution of the assets from God to his servants. But notice, secondly, the demonstration of stewardship. There is a demonstration of stewardship. Now notice this, if you would, in verse 16, the Bible says, Then he that had received the five talents went and traded with the same and made them other five talents. Now here we begin to see, letter A, the faithful stewards. We're going to see two faithful stewards. And the Bible tells us of this first one. He took his five talents and he began to trade. That is, he began to do business and he made five talents more with his master's talents. He was a faithful man. In the context of verse 16, the word traded carries a broad connotation. Uh, it means that he did business over a period of time. It, it means uh, that he was faithful uh, in his investments over a period of time. It doesn't mean that he went out and played the lottery. It doesn't mean that he went out and gambled with this. But uh, traded means that over time he faithfully stewarded what God had given to him. The servant did not simply make one good investment and then sit back, but no doubt he traded, he retraded, he studied, he watched, he invested, he worked hard. Uh, perhaps he was involved in some various ventures, but he was faithful over time. Let me just say this. Be careful of get-rich-quick schemes. Be careful of those that guarantee a doubling overnight or uh, something that we'll never miss. That's not what Jesus Christ is emphasizing in this parable. He's showing us a story of a faithful man over time. 1 Corinthians 6, 9 again says, They that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare, and many foolish and hurtful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. The word will be rich means those that will to be rich. In other words, all they want in life is to have have, have, make, make, multiply, multiply for themselves. God says they're going to have a lot of heartache in the process of that kind of a pursuit. But to trade over time, to be a faithful worker, to be a cautious investor, to be someone who avoids debt, to be someone who's always governing and stewarding God's resources is honorable, especially when we're wanting to advance the kingdom of God. And so we see the five-talent servant. Then we see, secondly, the two-talent servant. 
Someone says, why did one get five and one got two? Again, God gave them according to their ability. Verse 17 says, likewise, he that had received two, he also gained other two. And so he was able to gain two more talents himself. And we've, we've uh, learned that money is now a great servant, but a lousy God. And these men are using money to make money. And we must understand that if we don't manage money, money will manage us. And so these men are managing. They're stewarding what has been given to them by God. They were the faithful stewards. But we also see, secondly, the faithless steward. We see the faithless steward. Notice if you would in verse 18, it says, but he that had received one went and digged in the earth and hid his Lord's money. Here we see the one talent servant. This man lacked faith. Luke 19, 23 says, wherefore then gavest thou, uh, gavest not thou my money into the bank that at my coming I might have required mine own with usury. Here in the, in the other parable, or in the other gospel, the question is asked, couldn't you have at least put it in, in the bank, maybe a 1% CD, something? Couldn't you have uh, done something with what I gave to you? Here, this man lost his opportunity. Oh, that we would determine that we want to be faithful stewards of what God has given to us, and that we want to invest so that we might uh, be able to advance the kingdom of God. I heard about a man that once met the Lord and he said to God, he said, God, what is a million years to you? And God said, it's like a second. And, um, and then uh, the answer came, well, what is, or the question came, what is $10 million to you? And God said to this man, it's like a dime. And then uh, the man said, well then, uh, can I borrow a dime? And God said, just a second. The fact of the matter is that all of us need to learn that God is the giver of every good gift and that he wants us to invest according to his will. The distribution of resources is very, very clear. The demonstration of stewardship is very clear. Some people are wise stewards, which enables them to give. Others take what God gave them and they bury it in a hole. And they are unable to do what God intended them to do. Let me encourage you, be a wise steward of what God has given to you and be a generous steward of what God has given to you. We see the distribution of resources. We see the demonstration of stewardship. Then I want you to see finally this morning, the day of reckoning. There is a day of reckoning in the parable. And let's begin seeing this in verse 19. After a long time, the Lord of those servants cometh and reckoneth with them. Now think about uh, the poignant statements here. The Lord cometh. By the way, how many of you are glad for that? Amen. And as you steward wisely, you have rejoicing in your heart that you've been laying up treasures in heaven and you've been raising up your families. You've been serving God and here you are in God's house this morning. All of these things cause us to look forward to the coming of the Lord. The Lord cometh. But also, the verse says in verse 19, there is a reckoning. Now, as, as is stated earlier, uh, there are times of accounting in our lives. There are times of accounting financially. There are times of accounting for responsibilities that you've been given. The Lord is coming, and the Lord will reckon. There will be a call to accountability. Now, the journey seems to imply the space between the first and second advent of the Lord Jesus, uh, the first coming and the second coming. And so we're mindful of the fact that one day we will see the Lord face to face. Acts 1 and verse 11 reminds us of the ascension of Jesus Christ. And it says, which also said, ye men of Galilee, the angel speaking to the disciples, ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus which is taken from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. And I'm thankful today that the same Jesus that ascended up into heaven will in like manner, that is to say, literally, bodily, and physically, 
come again for his own. The Lord will return. And secondly, the Lord will reckon. We saw that in Romans 14.10. For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And it is there that we will be glad that we took advantage of every opportunity that we've had to give unto the Lord, to serve the Lord in whatever capacity. You will never regret when you stand before the Lord that you gave, that you witnessed, that you loved in Jesus' name. You'll never regret what you have done in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now the world asks, what do you own? But Jesus asks, how do you use it? Andrew Murray said that. The world wants to know, hey, what do you have? What's your uh, asset sheet look like? But Jesus is going to ask, how did you use what you had? Did you use it for my purposes or did you use it for your purposes. There will be a call to accountability. And I want us all to bear that in our minds. And then secondly, there will be a commendation to the faithful. Those that are faithful are going to receive their reward. Now, here's a wonderful phrase. I want you to see it in verse number 21. The verse 20 says, And so he that had received five talents came and brought other five talents, saying, Lord, thou hast deliverest unto me five talents. Behold, I have gained beside them five talents more. And his Lord said unto him, Well done. Let's say those two words, shall we? Well done. Now, folks, how many of you want to hear Jesus say, Well done? Amen. Most every mature Christian here wants to hear that. And it is not stretching the text. It is not taking the Bible out of context to connect our stewardship to those words. There's a direct correlation. And Jesus sees this man who wisely managed the resources of God, who doubled the investment, and he says to that man, well done. You did a good job. Oh, what a tremendous testimony we see. And he says, furthermore, well done, verse 21, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of the Lord. And here we see that God is promising to him uh, a place of rulership in his millennial kingdom. And I do believe that there will be opportunities of, of blessing to serve with our King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And, and uh, I don't know exactly what uh, God uh, may have some of us to do during that period of time. Uh, maybe he'll let me be the mayor of Lancaster for, for a little while. I don't know. Uh, uh, maybe he'll, maybe he'll do something else. Maybe I'd love to be the governor of California just for that one stretch of time right there. And, uh, we would, we would have a lot of fun straightening out, uh, some of the problems that are, that are going on right now. It seems like every other bill has to do with some type of mutilation of a child or some type of promotion of some kind of perversion. How many of you know, I'd love to be the governor and turn that time back and make some changes in that area. But God says, well done now, good and faithful servant. He said, you've been faithful in these little areas. I'm going to give you some much bigger areas in my kingdom, uh, that you can be over and what a tremendous thought that is indeed. So there is a commendation to the faithful, you see. And uh, not only will the Lord entrust greater tasks to those who prove themselves faithful here in this life, but also we see that in his kingdom as well. And so we see uh, here a commendation. Uh, I want you to think about this commendation for just a moment and think about these words, well done. Well done. And I want you to see five ways that you can multiply talents. As we consider stewardship today, five ways to multiply talents. Let me give them to you. First, they may be in your notes. We must work diligently. We must work diligently. When I hear talk of reparations, when I see abuses in welfare, when you hear some of the liberal talk that comes out of D.C. and California today, it's actually repulsive, especially uh, when you consider the fact uh, that many times the people that are being discussed for these things uh, were not even in our, in our state, not even in a slave state, not even, not even close. 
The fact of the matter is today that there have been tragic situations in our history and there are needy people in our present day, but we must never forget God's plan for stewardship involves work. If a man, the Bible says, desire the office of a bishop, he desires a good work. The Bible says if a man does not provide for his own, he is worse than an infidel. We must never take away the incentive in this country for old-fashioned work on the part of its citizens. God says if you want to be blessed in stewardship, you must be faithful in work. Uh, and then secondly, uh, the principle that I would share with you is to transfer ownership. Transfer ownership. A Christian must transfer ownership of everything to the Lord. That means money, time, family, material possessions. Just say, Lord, all of this is yours. My education, whatever it is, I want to use it for you. Number one, God advocates work in his word. Number two, he advocates the transfer of ownership. Number three, steward effectively. Steward effectively. Let me encourage every family here to have a family budget. Let me encourage you to live within your means. Let me encourage you to live by that budget. Shop for value. Shop for the big ticket items, uh, two or three different places. Watch for the sales. But treat every one of these, uh, every one of these purchases with, with the utmost care. Here at Lancaster Baptist Church, there's no large item ever purchased without uh, three different options. There's no uh, contractor ever hired without multiple bids on the larger ticket items. Why? Because we want to steward well uh, with what God has given to us. Number four, save regularly. Save regularly. So important. I remember my dad teaching me as a young boy, and, and he said, son, I want to encourage you, always give at least 20%, always save at least 10. And, and, and oftentimes in, in our early years in college, we didn't always make those exact numbers, but the principle of saving was something that, uh, that was taught and should be lived. Proverbs eleven sixteen: a gracious woman retaineth honor, and a strong man retaineth riches. And there's nothing wrong with saving so long as it's not uh, some kind of a, of a lustful, hoarding, covetous type of a mentality, especially when it comes to enabling you to help others or to further the kingdom of God or to take care of some family need. And number five, the number five is to give generously. The more passionate our faith, the more consistent our giving. Notice there in 2 Corinthians 9, 6, it says this, but this I say, he which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly, and he which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. Every man according as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that ye always having all sufficiency in all things may abound to every good work. God says, if you want to grow in grace, if you desire to advance the kingdom through soul winning, through missions, through reaching children. I can give you the grace. I can give you the means whereby you can accomplish that. I love how Jim Elliott said it, the martyr who gave his life in South America while preaching the gospel and was killed by a tribe of cannibals. Jim Elliott before his death said this, a man is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. A man is no fool who give what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. Folks, I don't know about you. I've done a lot of funeral services in my day. I've never seen a hearse pulling a U-Haul trailer. We're not going to take it with us. And here, Jim Elliott makes a poignant a thought for us, and that is that you're not a fool to give what you cannot keep in order to gain the heavenly blessings, the well done, thou good and faithful servant from the Lord Jesus Christ. So we see a call to accountability. We see a commendation to those faithful men. But notice the condemnation to the unfaithful servant as we close this morning. Notice in verse 24, the Bible says, Then he that had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew thee that thou art an hard man, reaping where thou hast not sown, and gathering where thou hast not strawed. And I was afraid, and went and hid thy talent in the earth. Lo, there thou hast thine, that is thine. His Lord answered and said unto him, Thou wicked and slothful servant, thou knewest that I reap where I sowed not, and gather where I strawed not. 
Thou oughtest therefore to have put my money to the exchangers, and then at my coming I should have received mine own with usury or with interest. Take therefore the talent from him, and give it unto him which hath the ten talents. For unto every one that hath shall be given, and he shall have abundance. But from him that hath not shall be taken away even that which he hath. And cast ye the unprofitable servant into the outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now notice the servant did not truly know his master. This servant, he says, I, I knew that you were a hard man. He knew who the master was, but he didn't really know him in the sense of a personal relationship. He knew he was a master, but he did not know the Lord in the sense of the loving heart of God. Here we see that this, uh, uh, this man, like the other two, uh, is a slave identified as belonging to the master, representative of his belonging, perhaps, uh, to, uh, to the body of Christ, uh, uh, but still not understanding, uh, as are the others belonging to the body of Christ, but this man not understanding who Jesus really is. And we see here uh, that as he stands before the Lord, uh, his faithlessness is condemned. George Whitfield said, a true faith in Jesus Christ will not allow us to be idle. No, it is an active, lively, restless principle. It fills the heart so that it cannot be easily, uh, cannot be easy until doing something for the Lord Jesus Christ. Here we see uh, two faithful servants with a true relationship with the Lord. Here we see an unfaithful servant who didn't really know the Lord. He didn't know the heart of the Lord. And so we see him being called uh, to accountability by the Lord here. The servant did not know the master. Notice in verse 25, the Bible tells us about his knowledge of God. He says, and I was afraid. And he says, I took my talent and I hid my talent in the earth. Here is the problem with unbelief. It is that someone is fearful. Someone is afraid. Let me encourage you, if you're a true believer, you don't need to fear God when he asks you to give. You don't need to fear God when he asks you to trust. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart. The, the servant did not really trust the master. And this is what it boils down to. It's really not a matter of can and can't. It's a matter of will and won't. And this man was not trusting of the master. Thirdly, the servant is now judged by the master. Now, Jesus says something that's quite interesting here. And I see Jesus as he speaks to this man in verse number 26. He says, thou wicked and slothful servant, thou knewest that I reap where I sowed not and gather where I have not strawed. Thou oughtest, verse 27, to have put my money to the exchangers. Now, the ancient Roman banking system uh, was in many respects like modern times. Uh, you could take uh, a certain amount of money the loan rate at that particular time in the first century was 12% simple interest. In other words, Jesus is saying here, if you would have just put this one talent in the bank, you could have earned something. Why didn't you do something with it? You could have made a profit. Now, the primary reason for the judgment of the unprofitable servant is not that he didn't make a good investment. The application of this passage is not, if you're not a good investor, you're going to go to hell. That's not the application. But the application is this. The primary lesson about the third man is his unbelieving heart. He did not believe in the master. He did not believe in the identity of the master. And that is why the Bible says this man is unprofitable. By the way, how many of you know the only thing that makes us profitable is the grace of God and the presence of Jesus Christ? But this man did not believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is why he did not give. And so the Bible says that he is to be cast into outer darkness, verse 30. A common description of hell. God we know is light. But here we see that in, in God there is no darkness uh, at all, but here this man is cast into outer darkness. Light signifies God's presence. Darkness signifies God's absence. And the Bible says that in hell there will be weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. This unbelieving man who squandered his blessing, who did not believe in the goodness of the Lord, is now separated uh, in this parable from God for all of eternity. I want you to think of that with me this morning. I want you to think about the, the reality of heaven and hell as we close this morning. 
And I say to you, and I want you to listen right here as we close. There is a heaven, there is a hell. In fact, if there's no heaven and there's no hell, we don't need to be here this morning. But there is a heaven and there is a hell. There is a place with weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. And the unbeliever will spend eternity in this place called hell. If there is no judgment of believers, then we do not need to steward what God has given to us. But if there is a judgment, and this parable teaches us that there is, and Romans 14 and 2 Corinthians 5 teach us that there is a judgment, then we are wise with to take our time and our talents and our treasures and to honor God because the Lord will return and there will be a reckoning someday for the life that we live here on this earth. Friend, I want to encourage you. If you don't know the Lord Jesus as your Savior, if you're not sure that you're on your way to heaven, I want to encourage you to turn to Jesus today. Don't be like the unbelieving servant who just squandered his life. Turn to Jesus and realize that he died on the cross for your sin and ask him to come into your heart, forgive you, and be your Savior. If you're not ready for heaven, let me tell you, you don't want to go to a dark place where there is weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. Turn to the Lord and be saved and find in him your hope and a home in heaven. And if you are saved, then I want to encourage you next Sunday and for all of your life to invest and to be a faithful steward as unto the Lord. I know I've shared this illustration often, but I close with this. The story of the farmer in Texas that brought his pastor, Dr. George Truitt, out to his ranch. They walk through the living room, through the family room, through the dining room, and up some stairs to a kind of a lookout tower. That farmer said to the pastor, he said, Pastor, he said, I just wanted to show you my farm. He said, look over here to the west. He said, as far as you can see to the west, all of these oil rigs, he said, I own all of that. He said, look over here to the east. He said, as far as you can see to the east, he said, all of the fields, the grain fields, all of the wheat fields, he said, as far as you can see that direction, I own it all. He said, Pastor, look up here to the north, all, all these rolling hills with all the cows. He said, all that cattle, as far as you can see. He said, Pastor, I own it all. He said, look over here uh, to the south. He said, uh, all of this wooded land and forest. He said, as, as far as you can see, I own it all. And the pastor looked at the man and he said, sir, that's wonderful. But let me ask you this question. How much do you own in that direction? And that's what this is all about. Lay not up for yourselves treasures on this earth where moth and rust doth corrupt, but lay up for yourself treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt. If you've never accepted the Lord, I encourage you to trust him as your Savior today. You can't buy your way into heaven. He already paid the price for your sin. But if you have trusted the Lord, then seek ye first the kingdom of God and remember the parable of the stewards one day there will be a reckoning. May we be faithful in our stewardship until that day. Let's pray together, shall we? Father in heaven, we thank you for this parable of the stewards. Lord, we ask that you would help us to be wise stewards, generous givers, people that look forward to the day when we will see you face to face. And I pray for those in this room that may not be ready for that day. They may not know you as their Savior. And I pray, Lord, that you would help them today, that they would turn to you in faith and be saved. Our heads are bowed this morning. Our eyes are closed. I'd like to just take a moment before we're dismissed and ask you a question or two. And I wonder how many in this room today can say, Pastor Chapel, I am so thankful that my destiny eternally, as I understand the Bible, is not weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. I'm saved. I believe the Lord Jesus Christ promises me a home in heaven, and I'm looking forward to seeing the Lord someday because of what he's done for me on Calvary. If that's your testimony, can you lift your hand this morning as a testimony? I'm saved and heaven bound. God bless you. Now, maybe you're a guest with us, and maybe this sermon today was a little different for you. Let me just encourage you. We did not invite you here, nor does God want you here specifically for your finances. We're teaching about what Jesus says about stewardship. But the great news for you is that God loves you and Jesus died on the cross for your sin. And Jesus, the Bible says, is not willing that anybody should perish. He doesn't want anyone to go to an outer darkness for eternity. 
to a place called hell. He wants you to have a home in heaven. 